an interesting comment came on YouTube the other day, and I thought I'd deal with it with Fish Eater Friday because it does contain a very important question and one that deserves some in depth analysis. I will read the comment. I cannot help but feel confounded by you, Mr. Barton. You seem so certain that you are Pope, I think you actually believe it yourself. I would rebuke you, but I doubt I have anything to say that you have not already heard and disregarded multiple times. Guess what I have to say is this. Certainly you know of Christ's declaration in the Holy Bible, that the gates of hell would never triumph over the church. Yes? Yet you claim the papacy was usurped in 1958 by Pope John XXIII, who then ordered a heretical, in quotation marks, council, which the Holy Spirit had no role in guiding, which then destroyed the established church, invalidated its sacraments and holy orders, and left it ungoverned without a valid pope for decades until your supposed election. Tell me, in what way would such a scenario not be hell triumphing over the church, which Jesus declared would never happen? Was Jesus wrong? Or was the church being toppled with so-called popes being left in obscurity with one seminary and only 30, quote, sound followers, unquote, as you so put it in your documentary, somehow not hell triumphing over the church? I am rather curious as to what your answer will be to this. Well, I am going to answer it. First of all, it's not my documentary. I did not make it. Yeah, I made the statements, but I did not make the documentary. But let's get on to the point. Just uh, the other day, I read in Venerable Lewis's Gnada Summa the Christian Life. I just got a complete set of this and a beautiful bunch of books I got in Leavenworth. And I'd like to thank all those who helped me get these wonderful books. He wrote, Indeed, the sins of men are increasing so greatly that if we did not have the divine assurance that the gates of hell would never prevail against the church, we would have reason to fear that the fire that has involved the church would completely consume and destroy it. And if we take a look at the church today, we could really say that, or what calls itself the church out there. It is certain that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And I'm not denying this. I have never denied this. <clears throat> to say that they can is a heretical statement. And it's just the same as Vatican II saying that Allah, quote, the God of um, Islam, is a true God. Mm -hmm. That's what Vatican II says. That's heretical as well. The Catholic Church cannot continue in a heretical sect. That's impossible as well. And Vatican II formed a heretical sect. You cannot doubt that. But that's what we discussed elsewhere. What the, this person is saying is that because of Christ's promise, we must accept the line of claimants to the papacy from John 23rd to uh, Francis. That's apparently what he's, he or she is saying. <clears throat> and so where was the church between death, Pope Pius XII, and my own election? That's the uh, apparent question here. During the vacancy of the papacy, the church doesn't die. We have had many vacancies some a year, some two, even one about three years long. There was a period in church history when a year to two year vacancy was a matter of course. And during the early persecutions there were some longer vacancies. The church did not die. <clears throat> and I don't think the person who wrote this question would say that the church dies when the Pope does. What they're saying is that a prolonged vacancy would be saying that the church is dying. I'd like to read from a book by Father Edwin James O'Reilly from 1882, The Relations of the Church to Society, Theological Essays, page 287. He's commenting on the Western Schism. There was, I say, at every given time a pope, really invested with the dignity of vicar of Christ and head of the church. Whatever opinions might exist among many as to his genuineness. Not that an ignorant regnum covering the whole period would have been impossible or inconsistent with the promises of Christ, for this is by no means manifest. But that, as a matter of fact, there was not such an interregnum. What he's saying is that for the whole of Western schism, a vacancy 
would not be inconsistent with the promises of Christ. And that's a 40-year vacancy. That's how long the Western system lasted. It was 40 years. What we had is 40 years of two and eventually three claimants to the papacy. Today, we have several claimants to the papacy. I'm not, I am the Pope, but there are, are other claimants, although most of them have fallen away or died, leaving no successors. One time, there were um, four elections, mine and three others. You have the false claimant in Rome, then you had some seers. Most of those, we just discount them because popes are elected. So let us return to the point. Henry Edward Cardinal Manning gave a series of four lectures in the late 1800s, which have been reprinted in a book, The Present Crisis of the Holy See. You want to understand this situation? Read the book. I would like to quote part of it. Because he's talking about there will come a time in history that is, well, today mm -hmm. and the last 50 plus years. The Holy Fathers who have written upon the subject of Antichrist, yes, Antichrist is going to come sometime in history, and that's what Cardinal Manning is saying. And of these prophecies of Daniel, without a single exception, as far as I know, and they are the fathers both of the East and the West, the Greek and the Latin Church, all of them unanimously say that in the latter end of the world, during the reign of Antichrist, the holy sacrifice of the altar will cease. There will be no masses, what are you saying? In the work on the end of the world ascribed to St. Hippolytus, after a long description of the afflictions of the last day, we read as follows. The churches shall lament with a great lamentation, for there shall be offered no more oblation, nor incense, nor worship acceptable to God. The sacred buildings of the churches shall be as hovels, and the precious body and blood of Christ shall not be manifest in those days. The liturgy shall be extinct, the chanting of psalms shall cease, the reading of Holy Scripture shall be heard no more, but there shall be upon men darkness and mourning upon mourning and woe upon woe. Then the church shall be scattered, driven into the wilderness, and shall be for a time as it was in the beginning, invisible, hidden in catacombs, in dens, in mountains, and lurking places. For a time it shall be swept, as it were, from the face of the earth. Such is the universal testimony of the fathers of the early centuries. Important point. The fathers of the church, when they unanimously agree on a point, the church considers infallible. So at some time in history, there will be Antichrist, and he will take away the holy sacrifice of the Mass completely. So a decimation of the church will come in history. This is infallibly true. What I am saying, and I'm not the only one, there are many others, is that it happened at the time of Vatican II, and we're at the tail end of it now. Vatican II and Antichrist came together. It's happened in the past. St. Jerome said, the world groaned and found itself Arian. Interestingly enough, in 355 AD, the emperor opened a false council at Milan in order to promote Arianism, much like Vatican II was opened by anti-pope John XXIII, the second anti-pope John XXIII in history. He opened one in the Vatican in order to found a new sect, which his successor, Paul the Antichrist VI, I believe is Antichrist, I'll discuss that elsewhere, and he called this sect he founded the Conciliar Church at the end of Vatican II. Read the closing, his closing statement. It's uh, sometimes quoted as the Church of the Council. That is why this uh, Vatican II church relies mostly on Vatican II. If they don't like anything else, they just reject it. Vatican II, they accept. Okay. St. Athanasius rode his flock while he was in exile. Even if Catholics faithful to tradition are reduced to a handful, they are the ones who are the Church of Jesus Christ. He says it can be reduced to a handful. The prophet Isaiah says they can be reduced to a handful. So small a handful that a little child can write their names down. Book of Isaiah. A child can write their names down. St. Augustine goes further and he reduces the church in the Old Testament times to a single person. 
he names off Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and Lot. And we can see during the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, all of the apostles fled at one point. The church remained in the Blessed Virgin Mary alone. The prophet Daniel writes, But at that time shall Michael rise up, the great prince, who standeth for the children of thy people, and a time shall come such as never was from the time that nations began, even until that time. And at that time thou shall thy people be saved, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And Jesus said, For there shall then be great tribulation such as have not been from the beginning of the world until now, neither shall be. He's referring to the time of Antichrist. He also said, You will all be scandalized in my regard this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep shall be dispersed. Popes Benedict the Fourteenth and Pius the Ninth tell us that the lambs who Jesus told Peter to feed, feed my lambs, and the sh are the faithful, all the faithful in the world. When Jesus said, feed my sheep, the sheep are the bishops. The bishops are scattered. And I believe that <clears throat> the mystical by the Christ, which will also suffer a passion, the time of Antichrist, in other words, we are at the end of this passion now. We're close to the resurrection. In fact, we could be past the resurrection in some regards. We could consider it. The bishops will be scattered. Not one bishop remained faithful at Vatican II. Not one bishop, and this includes Lefebvre and Yu Din Tuk. Yu Din Tuk signed all the documents. Lefebvre signed all but two of the documents, and some of the documents Lefebvre signed are also heretical, as the two he refused to sign. Every bishop deserted. And so where is the church from 58 until 90, or at least from the signing of the uh, heretical documents of Vatican II, let's say 1965, when the last one was signed. And all the bishops at Vatican II had left the Catholic Church, each and every one of them. Because when you sign a heretical document, you become a formal heretic, you resign all offices in the church, you leave the church completely, you're gone, you're out. Yes, you can come back, but you have to be reconciled by the Pope. Um, the faithful can be reconciled by their own diocesan bishop. And even a priest can be reconciled by his own diocesan bishop. He cannot be restored to the priesthood, though, except by the Pope. So where is the church from 58 until 90? First of all, not all bishops were present at Vatican II. The most famous was uh, the case of Cardinal Menzenti. He was in uh, the American Embassy in Budapest. Also, Popes Pius XI and XII sent priests and bishops into communist Russia and Pius XII into communist China. These bishops had special faculties as diocesan bishops to consecrate their own successor because of the impossibility of having contact with Rome and having a successor appointed. There is evidence that the Catholics, faithful Catholics in Russia and China remained faithful until at least the 1990s. I believe they're still there today. In 1984, a bishop was released from China. True, he came back and went and hugged John Paul II. It's my opinion they had so brainwashed they could finally release him. But by his release, we know of his existence. And that's when they caught. How many did they not catch? And even if they caught all the bishops in China, there are priests and faithful. And priests would eventually die off, but they would still be faithful. Remember, Japan lasted 200 years. There were still Catholics when it reopened. So there are still people faithful, holding to the Catholic faith. What's more interesting is when the uh, wall came down in Berlin in 1990, and Russia started becoming, quote, more open, the Vatican immediately sent in priests to Russia to contact the underground church. The reason they gave is that 
There are people in Russia who still believe in 1950s theology. In other words, there's still Catholics who believe in the Catholic faith, and we got to destroy that. We got to change that. From what I've picked up from various sources, when these priests showed up, it's like a, a groundhog sticking his head out of a hole, looking around. They looked around, and mm -mm, persecution still up, right back down their hole. It's a new persecution. They refused these priests, and they said, "We're not coming out from underground." I think they're still there. I haven't gotten any real information in the last uh, few years, but I think they are still there. Even if they're not, the fact that they lasted past 1990, which we do know, would give a continuity. And so, I am not denying the faith. I say the gates of hell did not prevail against the church. The church has suffered the worst crisis in history, just as our Lord Jesus Christ himself predicted. And so, there's the answer to your question. I know this video has gotten real long, but it was an important question that required a long answer. So go enjoy your fish today on Fish Eater Friday. God bless you all.